Here we go. <laughs> Good afternoon. This is Dr. Joan Cartwright. And today, our guest on Asala South Africa TV is Dr. Valerie Patterson. And Dr. Patterson teaches at Florida International University. She teaches African and African disorder studies. And I'm just introducing her. So she's going to take it from here. I'm going to stop my screen share. And of course, we will tell everyone that Asala is the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. Our national office is in Washington, D.C., and we are the South Florida branch. So, Valerie, I'll stop sharing my screen and you can start sharing yours. Welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Cartwright, for this invitation. And uh, I'm going to start sharing my screen right now and use my slideshow. Um, well, actually, I need to go back. I need to play from the start. Right. So um, everybody, can, can you see it OK? Yes. OK, great. <laughs> Thanks. So um, again, thank you to um, Dr. Joan Cartwright for this um, wonderful invitation. And I am um, Valerie Patterson, um, professor of uh, clinical professor of public policy and administration at Florida International University, also um, the current director of the African and African Diaspora Studies Program here at, at FIU, and um, a member of ASALA for um, several years, and most recently the, the um, South Florida branch. And um, so again, thank you for this, this uh, amazing invitation. So I, um, I wanted to just talk about my, um, what I call um, going from uh, voted most militant, which was, uh, um, I was voted most militant female in my senior class at uh, Carl Gables High. Uh, so going from that to um, being director of African and, and African diaspora studies here at, um, here at FIU. And this image is actually from um, a slide that was a part of a presentation that I did in a, in a uh, a, pre a previous Asala uh, conference. And, and I used it to, to sort of ground my discussion. I used it to ground it, my discussion of, of, of the migration uh, in my family from um, the Caribbean. And so um, I wanna just, just start with a, a quote from Clint Smith um, for the, New York Times, he was, he was writing for the New York Times 1619 project. And he says, I slide my finger from Senegal to South Carolina and feel the ocean separate a million families. The soft hum of history spins on its tilted axis. A cavalcade of ghost ships wash their hands of all they carried. And so, yes, um, we are connected in multiple ways with the, the continent uh, and we are even connected in the, um, in the diaspora. And this image, if I could take a second to briefly discuss it is, is actually um, part of my um, art practice. I also do mixed media art and this is a doll that I created um, with the um, face of Harriet Tubman who is one of my muses in terms of, of my art. And I, I draped and dressed the doll in a kente, authentic kente fabric, and also included an image of uh, Trayvon Martin because um, his life has much significance for us here in South Florida and, and across the country.
So yeah, um, so my um, uh, my African American life and in, in, in history in uh, Miami. I, I grew up here in Miami um, and lived in Coconut Grove, and um, and I like to. Cut, I thought that connecting um, the words of "lift every voice" would be uh, useful for this presentation and um because for all of us of, of african descent uh african-american descent uh here in the states uh it, it, especially if you're in my age group <laughs> then lift every voice uh plays a major role in your life and especially in your education so um back to the grove if for those of you who don't know the coconut grove was um settled in uh, 1868 by black and white homesteaders. And in terms of the, um, uh, this is from a, a paper that I wrote, again, for an Asala paper focused on migration. Uh, you can't tell the growth story without telling the story of, uh, or presenting the history and impact of, of, of Bahamians, Bahamian settlers. And um, most significantly uh, for me is, I have to tell the story of Mariah Brown, who arrived uh, in Miami by way of Key West to work at the, the Peacock Inn. And um, there's a, a proclamation that was issued by the city of Miami on March 16th in, in 2018, where um, March 16th, 2018 was proclaimed Mariah Brown Day um, for the city of Miami. She was one of the first black homeowners in the city of Miami and left a tremendous legacy. Also can't tell the story about the early Miami without talking, without mentioning the fact that black men um, were registered to vote in the, um, uh, the incorporation. You know, there was, a, there was a vote to incorporate the city of Miami. And so the Flagler organization where many of these uh, early Bahamian men who came uh, worked for the um, organized black men to vote in that election. And the, um, they, the black men provided 162 of the 368 votes for incorporation. And what's interesting to note, and then to connect in sort of, you know, current challenges that we face in this country related to voting is that um, um, they provided the, the vote um, that passed the, uh, that allowed the incorporation to pass and they were subsequently and almost immediately sort of disenfranchised from um, all that um, this newly incorporated city had to offer in, term, in terms of ownership, home ownership and and economic uh, prosperity, and and um, and and the challenges remain. So, um, I, I also in telling the the story of of the Grove, which is is you know where I was born and raised. Um, Chanel Rose actually writes about. Uh, and her, her book is called The Struggle for Black Freedom in Miami's Civil, right, Civil Rights and America's Tourist, <laughs> Tourist Paradise, 1896 to um, 1968. Again, you know, starting with that incorporation, uh, the incorporation vote. That, so Rose Wright said that while... Um, they were initially welcomed for their labor, right? And there was this perception, especially by those in, 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 in Miami, that these um, Black Bahamians were, were docile and they, they were laid back. And um, actually what happened, uh, according to Rose, is that many Bahamian Blacks established a culture of resistance that rejected the subjugation by openly, openly defying white supremacy. And 
actually, you know, one of the stories that I uncovered in, um, in reading Rose's text, and I was able to sort of connect to, to people who I knew um, of Mr. Alba Gibson, <laughs> for example, who refused to get um, American citizenship and actually was a, a was a Garveyite is that um, and that many Bahamians actually refused to relinquish their British citizenship because of the ways they were treated by the white establishment in Miami and the, and the hostility that they found in parts of South, South Florida and actually you know um, actually protested and complained to the British government about how they were being treated. And I also thought it was like useful to, um, to include this, the, the commentary that was published in the Miami Herald in uh, 1911 uh, that, that criticized and, and denigrated um, uh, the Negro population at that time and argued that they were like a plague carrying devastation to, uh, with it to all surrounding property. And so again, um, I can't think about my history in Miami and growing and born and raised in Miami without having this understanding and this, this knowledge of, of how um, people were, uh, black people were treated during that time. So um, in starting to work on uh, uh, the, the migration paper for um, the Asala conference, it was uh, several years ago. And also most recently, the, um, the, the Black family, I, um, I thought it was, was important for me. And, and actually for the last, I would say 10 years, have been trying to amass and, and, and gather information on, um, on both my paternal and my maternal sides. And so um, now my, my, on my paternal side were um, my great, great, great grandmother and Gaffney presented here, whose image is here at the top. Next to her is my great grandmother, Carrie Lyles. Um, here is my grandmother, Teresa O'Shell. And, um, and this final picture is of, of my father, Benny Lyles, and, uh, and me as a, as a young toddler. And so, yeah, um, they came to, uh, well, my grandmother and, and, and my father migrated from South Carolina down to Miami. First, my grandmother went to Charleston and then she, she ended up uh, coming to Miami and, and my father and his siblings followed her. So um, because of um, uh, this side of my family, the, the images, the, the pictures um, that um, have been collected over the years are, are amazing and massive. And um, we started sharing this, these, these images in our South Carolina um, family reunions. And so I'm, I'm, I'm starting to and continue to build the knowledge and, and gather research on um, my paternal side. And then uh, on my maternal side where I'm really focusing uh, um, most of this presentation because it's the, it's the Miami story, right? Um, and so um, I titled this slide, Let It Resound Loud as, as, loud as the Rolling Sea and looking at the 1920s um, and, and earlier. Um, so the Rolling Sea figured prominently in my family's migration story as my grandmother Kiva, um, her sister Maud, and their mother traveled by ship to the United States from the Bahamas in uh, 1919. And so um, my, my uncle Wilfred actually appears on the, the, the 1920 
federal census as uh, a alien Bahamian farm labor who arrived in the United States in uh, 1912. And so um, in the research that I was doing for the, the migration paper uh, that I, I presented at Asala, at the Asala conference, um, I, I looked on, um, linked through the, the census documents and actually via um, Ancestry, and I was actually able to find the, um, the, the, the ship manifest of my, um, my great grandmother, my grandmother and her sister, my grand aunt, actually coming by ship. Um, they, they sailed from, so this side of my family, maternal side of my family is from Harbor Island in the Bahamas. It's one of the family islands, as they say. Uh, so they went from Harbor Island to Elutra, from Elutra to New Providence and Nassau, from New Providence and Nassau, the ship sailed to uh, Key West, uh, and from Key West, uh, they, they came to Miami. And um, so um, my grandmother, Kiva, actually died when uh, my mother was four, and her aunt then took on the responsibilities of uh, rearing my, my mother, along with my, um, my two cousins here, uh, Joe Scavella and Carnet Scavella. So they were all related. Um, uh, they were children of four, uh, three to, there were four, four to five, uh, I think it was four girls and, and, um, and one one boy out of that that family out of uh, out of Harbor Island, and um, my grandmother and her three sisters um, ended up here in the states. Their brother went up to New York, but um, they all died. And what what essentially happened was my cousins here, Joseph and and Carnet, actually had to rear um, my mother. Uh, my, my mother was also um, assigned um, trustees because my, my, um, her grandmother left her this, this house. And we called it the big house uh, in Coconut Grove because on the, the, um, on the first floor was where all of our family lived. On the second floor was a rooming house. And so my mother you know, is a child, is, has, has borders um who live on the, the the second floor of this house and essentially you know many of those people who who were who were renting those rooms were actually became more like family because everyone was there together um so for me um I attended uh, George Washington Carver Elementary School in, in uh, Coconut Grove. And, um, and so I, I, I went from the 20s to looking at the, the 40s and, and 50s, both you know, trying to, to think about my family, um, both maternal and paternal size, and also um, the experiences that um, I had growing up as a child. In, in Coconut Grove. And so we talk about the Grove, um, uh, George Washington Carver Elementary School figures very prominent. It was elementary, junior high. I went to the elementary school in junior high. Uh, and then um, it was also a senior high. And the last class, uh, uh, the last graduating class at the senior high was in, in uh, 1965. And I'll talk more about that in a second. But I, I, I want to take some time to talk about, uh, to, to discuss and, and um, honor the, the memory of uh, Father Gibson, uh, Reverend Cannon Theodore Gibson, who is shown here with his, um, his widow, Ms. Thelma Gibson. Um, so he was the, the, the um, um, father, of the minister of the Christ Episcopal Church 
But he also was very active in the, in the civil rights struggle and served as president of the Miami chapter of the NAACP from 1954 to 64. So, um, that his, his, the history of his participation, his contribution uh, to uh, slum abatement, to um, increasing civil rights, uh, um, to ensuring that, um, um, that schools were desegregated, to um, impacting and influencing uh, a policy change is significant. Um, he also, when my husband and I married in um, in 1976, he also served as um, he he married my husband and I in in, in the rectory of the church, and so um, so Father Gibson had a sort of a significant impact on Black Miami. Um, you know, he subsequently at, at he at one point was a, a, a Miami City Commissioner, so on Black Miami, on the civil rights struggle, and in all my life. <laughs> um, but I also want to mention um, the impact of, of being a student at, um, at George Washington um, G.W. Carver Elementary School, right? Um, so when 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 I started hearing about Asala conferences and, and uh, because I have a, a, a cousin up in DC who actually attends uh, many of the, the um, Black History Month luncheons and, and volunteers and started learning more and more about Asala and, and felt very strongly that I wanted to be uh, involved in, in participating. Um, I thought about, you know, how growing up in Miami and attending segregated schools like Conver, how you know we had teachers who who um, emphasized the importance of of learning African American history and and I remember Negro History Week and that eventually became you know Black History Month and the the the, the significance and, and impact of Dr. Carter G. Woodson. Uh, and so that, that attending those schools, attending Carver and participating uh, in the programming that took place during Negro History Week, having teachers who are from the community. So my second and third grade teacher actually um, was the daughter of a, a Bahamian family who lived right next door to us on, on Washington Avenue, Miss Helena Holton. And, 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 and those te the teachers in, in, in my elementary school years and my junior high school years at Culver stressed the importance of learning this history and stressed the importance of, of um, reading. And, and, and so, you know, when now when, when I think of Ida B. Wells and I think of the, the influence and impact that she has on my art practice, um, it was because I, you know, it all started in in third grade with Miss Anderson insisting that you know we read and 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 read and and read more. So um, this discussion of of um, Black Miami, my Black Miami, my African American life in Miami, um, couldn't be complete with. Out thinking about um, um, if we have we have come over a way uh, thinking about the impact of of immigration uh, on myself and others who were here in the '60s, and so Marvin Dunn, who is uh, actually a former colleague here uh, at FIU, but also um, an amazing historian um, and who's written. Uh, an impactful um, tome on, on, on the history of, of, of Black Miami talked about how um, Miami during this time moved from a focus on securing the gains of the civil rights movement uh, to a shift away from the concerns of, of Blacks in Miami 
in, in, in the 1960s. And so um, 60s, 70s, major impactful years, but, um, and depending on who you talk to about um, Miami, if it's my mother's generation or, or, or even in my own gen generation, we felt the impact of this movement away from um, securing the gains of the civil rights movement to um, a focus on um, immigration and, and, and newly arriving immigrants and the struggle for um, scarce resources, right? And, 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 and the quest for a full uh, economic parity. And I argue in, in thinking about um, the, the history of my African-American life here in, in, in Miami is that you know, the, the, the quest for full economic participation actually remains. So um, I mentioned the seventies briefly, but the the seventies, as I recall them, um, I I thought about the the nineteen seventy one riot in the Grove, uh, and and you know that was the height of of um, uh, Black Power movement. Um, that was um, a period where you know. Um, it, it really was this, you know, Afros and 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 the impact of of um, the Black Panthers, and um, and so um, in the nineteen seventy one riot in the Grove, uh, I I remember because I I actually lived on the main drag, which was Grand Avenue. Um, it was very interesting, at, at so we had moved from our family home on on Washington Avenue to Big House. We moved from the big house to the little house, which was a, a family home that we, we had on Grand Avenue uh, that was also built by my cousin. And it was, you know, there's nothing like living on the main drag, you know, where you see everything that's happening right outside your window. Um, and our front door had jealousies and I could look out of the window, our, our um, house, the, our porch, was also adjacent to uh, the bus stop of a, of a major bus route, you know, so people would always be there waiting for the bus. But back to this riot, um, just viewing the confrontation and the, and the conflict between um, law enforcement and people who were just merely walking down the street, but, um, because of the unrest, the civil unrest that was happening at the time, um, ended up, you know, having to engage and interact with um, with police officers who didn't look like them, and who are actually uh, the city of Carl Gables actually started right across the street from from where I was, and so I just I clearly as if it were yesterday. Remember sitting there um, on the couch in my living room and observing this Carl Gables Police Department, uh, this officer from the Carl Gables Police Department actually stopping his car, getting out, uh, standing on the hood of his vehicle and pointing his weapon into the face of a young black man who was actually walking on um, Grand Avenue on Brooklyn Street in the Grove. And so, um, and then, you know, it, of course, this is a time in the country where there was lots of civil unrest. And, and so I also thought about um, the Democratic and Republican conventions that were actually held, on, both held on, on Miami Beach in, in 1972. And um, being a, a student, high school student, and working in my local high school as an intern that summer and um, having to um, walk through the, the halls of the school 
and the halt that the, the National Guard was actually living on campus and, and camped there um, in the local high school. And my local high school was, was um, actually also um, inside the office, which is where I worked after my internship ended, was also a, a station was set up for the National Guard. So, so sitting there uh, answering the calls for Carl Gables High, while across from me, maybe 20 feet away was a National Guard officer who's answering calls from the National Guard. So, so it was very um, amazing and uh, informative experience. Uh, but it wasn't until years later that I learned about Shirley Chisholm. And so, you know, the, the, the person who is most interested in African-American history, the person who considers, you know, Shirley Chisholm, I consider her one of my, my muses, my art muses as well. I, I incorporate her life in the courses that I teach on, on uh, women in administration. But the, the fact that, that she was there, in Miami in 1972, Chisholm on bought on Boston and that, you know, I was a high school kid and, and didn't even know about her. I wasn't aware of her. Um, um, is, you know, now years later has, has had an impact, but, and, and so I'm making up for what I didn't know uh, in 1972 in, in ensuring that, you know, this next generation of students knows as much as they can about the impact and influence of Congresswoman um, Shirley Chisholm and her run for president in 1972. So the seventies took me into the the eighties, I'm older now, I have a, family, I have a daughter and, and um, um, I'm a spouse. And, um, and again, as if it were just yesterday, the, the beating and death of, of Arthur McDuffie by uh, Miami-Dade County police officers figures prominently in that history. And you can't tell the Miami story, you can't tell the story of Black Miami without talking about and discussing and remembering and reflecting on the, the, the Miami riots and the, all of the events that, that led to um, the death of, of Mr. Arthur McDuffie. And so um, I remember my grandmother calling me frantically because even though you know she lived in Coconut Grove, there was some unrest that, that um, happened at, at, at that on uh, and, and coconut grove as well and and you know I, she called frantically saying you know they're riding out out here and she she just didn't know what to do and it was like you know just stay in the house and and um and you know stay away from from the doors uh she she also lived on on grand avenue at that point i had moved to um uh, north of, of where I, I, I grew up but, but still in Coconut Grove. So the Miami riot lasted 24 hours and um, um, an estimated 18 people were killed. Um, I, I worked in the Civic Center and, and the, the um, murder actually occurred um, not too far away from there, um, but over $100 million in, in damages. Uh, and uh, occurred as a result of the, the Miami um, riot. And so Dr. Dunn, again, um, has a, 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 a chapter focused on, on, um, Mac, on the McDuffie riots. And he said that the, he, wrote, he writes that the demands after the meeting, I say there was a community meeting held and the, uh, um, the demands included um, get rid of racist cops, um, provide better opportunities for Blacks. So, so again, that, that quest for um, civil rights, that quest, the quest for economic 
parity, if not prosperity, uh, remained. And, um, and, and to this day, I would argue that those, those challenges those challenges still remain. And, and so the so very important documentary that was um, uh, produced um, by a young filmmaker here in Miami, and it's called When Liberty Burns, um, debuted uh, maybe two, two years ago. And, uh, and, and again, this is a, a young filmmaker who who was of Haitian descent and didn't know about the McDuffie riots, but happened to find out some information and started to ask his friends, do you know about uh, the uh, um, McDuffie riots? Do you know about the Miami riots? They didn't know and he felt compelled to um, start work on this document documentary, uh, again, When Liberty Burns that, um, offers a very compelling um, overview of what happened and, and some of the people who, you know, were there, who, who were work in law enforcement, who were community activists, who were community organizers and, and getting their perspective and view um, and some years later. And from the, the 80s then is thinking about the 90s and, and the 90s are, are significant for me uh, in the sense that I was, um, had started my doctoral program at that point, uh, but clearly remember how excited I was when Nelson Mandela was, was released from prison. Uh, but my, um, the history in the history of Black Miami, when you talk about the 90s and, and you mentioned Mandela, then you have to, to ponder and, and, and consider the impact of um, the Mandela tourism boycott, right? So um, in July of 1990, uh, led by attorney H.T. Smith, an economic boycott, of the local tourism industry was uh, launched and led um, after the the elected the Cuban American elected officials at the time snubbed uh, South Africans Nelson Mandela, and the boycott was actually called a quiet riot. And and so the you know the kind of uh, the 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 history the 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 um, the nuanced history of the um, black community and the, the, the Cuban American community uh, now, so it's a black community, African American community, Haitian American community, Cuban American community, this movement to um, being um, designated a majority minority community. And when I hear that, I always say, well, but what if you're a minority in the majority minority community? Um, that that could be problematic. So I may talk about that more in a second. But um, um, the cost and impact. So the the the, the boycott had uh, a major cost and, and impact. Um, many uh, major organizations did not bring their conventions here. So the estimates are um, in terms of lost convention business and tourism dollars range from um, 20 million to, to 50 million dollars. Um, of course, um, there were some changes. There, there, was, there were some concessions made. Um, one of the policy gains I think that, that Dr. Dunn talks about is uh, the, um, court-ordered single-member districts resulted with um, that, that led to better representation of, of, of uh, underrepresented groups. Um, also the creation of a visitor industry council to um, expand uh, African-American participation in the, the county's uh, tourism industry. 
Um, I'm gonna go back for a second. Um, and so, um, <laughs> Okay, so, so, so again, um, that the, the challenges <laughs> remain. Uh, so my, my discussion of, of, of um, actually stopped uh, for the, the first phase of this work that I had with, with the 90s where one of the presentations that um, I, I, um, uh, use this this work in um so <laughs> before i sort of conclude um the the overview of my african-american life and, and history and and in miami i just wanted to to, to spend a, a couple of minutes talking about um my other passion um so this work, being director of African and African diaspora studies, is definitely a passion of mine. Um, and uh, because of of the um, the legacy, the the impact and influence of all of the African American teachers that I had uh, being a student at at uh, G W Carver Elementary School and 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 um, and junior high school now uh, um, a middle school. Um, just want to go back a second because there is something that I, I sort of skipped over, but I, I want to just take a, a minute to, to um, call your attention to, to this historical legacy that exists in, in Coconut Grove and, and definitely at, at George Washington Carver high school. So every year during, during uh, Black History Month, um, there's a, a, um, a program that takes place at the, the, at the middle school, right? So the high school ended in 1965. And, um, and so it's now a middle school. It's a international, so it's a magnet, international school. They, um, the, the demography of the school <laughs> is not very reflective of its surrounding uh, community, right? Which is uh, predominantly African American, but the 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 school as a magnet school is not. But one of the things that that takes place is that every year during Black History Month, there is this program that brings in all of the previous uh, graduating classes uh, of George Washington Carver um, when it was a high school, and also does a, a tremendous um, and Im important, uh, makes a tremendous and important contribution in terms of advancing the history of Dr. Carver, his work, and also of the school itself. And so in 2020, um, um, there was a commemorative booklet published um, that included the previous classes. So if you see there, what you can read, it says the, the history of, of Carver beginning in 1901 and the high school graduating classes from 1939 to 1966 and, uh, the, the, and then a presentation of the families of of the coverite. So each one of those classes had uh, um, had a name: um, the conquistadors, uh, the the um, I, I can't think of of, of uh, some of the others, but it had these uh, major names. And each class is is called out. And if there are from the, those earlier classes, if there are still surviving members then they're asked to stand. Um, and for each class, the surviving or, or currently living members are, are asked to class, are asked, are asked to stand. And then for the last five years, there, there's a um, Hall of Fame inductee that um, 
is presented for from um, previous classes. And this is, it offers a tremendous legacy. Um, I think that be, between the um, not considering the kids who are in high school or who are in, in middle school, I usually am the, the, the youngest person who attends in, um, from the adult, adult group, from, so from previous classes. So it's usually, so I'm in my 60s, it's usually um, uh, the attendees are, are usually in their, their 70s uh, up to um, uh, their late 90s uh, who attend this event along with the, the kids in, in the, the middle school. And it's, it really is major because again, the, the kids are learning this history that is, is so important. So, um, my muses, my, my, as I mentioned earlier, my um, other passion is, is my mixed media art. And my mixed media art is influenced very heavily by um, my muses, whether it be Harriet Tubman, um, Sojourner Truth, um, Ida B. Wells, Barnett, and other historical Black women. Uh, who's on, on whose shoulders we stand. Uh, so it's either I do collages and or, or um, jewelry or pins or cameos or brooches. This is all a part of my art. And I just wanted to sort of take a second to, to show some of the images that of, of my artwork because you know, I've had a few exhibits at this point and um, I wanted to include that work because that it really is a part of my the, the, the history of my African American life. And so my my final slide is is um, thinking about um, the uh, um, James Walden Johnson's um, and I'm, I started with "Lift Every Voice" because of the significance of of that song. We had to learn it. Uh, it, when I attended Carver Elementary School and, and, and middle school. And of course we sing it uh, um, when, where, wherever we can, uh, especially um, the university has a major commemorative celebration for Dr. King in January of, of each year that lasts an entire, entire month. And so, um, so I am with, it's God of our weary years. Um, so in 2020, Black Miami or my, my African-American life uh, remains a, um, a, a tale of two cities. Um, I have friends who, who left many years ago who come to visit in the summers to see their families and they always say, I can't, I can't believe you still live here. <laughs> and I have an aunt who's also an artist and, and she left in the 50s and she said, you know, she would never come back. Um, she's come to visit a few times um, since my grandmother's death in, in, in the late 80s, but she said she would never, she would never live here again. So um, there are disparities, inequities, um, and competition for scarce resources. There's gentrification and, 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 and segregated neighborhoods. Um, but um, the, the, the goal is to, to make a difference, right? And, and to ensure that this next generation of students who, who I encounter, whether they're in my public policy and administration courses, or whether they're students who are enrolled in um, FIU's African and African diaspora studies, uh, master's program, the, we have uh, several undergraduate certificates, we have a, a graduate, two graduate certificates, um, and we have four uh, MA to PhD pathway programs to ensure that th this next generation of, of, of um, Black leadership is, is um, learning this history and also making a difference and, and, uh, and, and making a contribution to seeing it change. So um, 
I see a hand raised. <laughs> that, that this was so interesting. That was, and it is to me personally because my father was born on Long Island, Bahamas. Right. And the history of the Haitians here is a sh sh quiet thing. Mm -hmm. you know, so this was very revealing. I want to know. We have two guests, Eleanor and Roxanne, and I'm so happy that they joined us. And I want to know if either or both have any questions for Valerie. Hi, this is Eleanor, and I've enjoyed listening to Dr. Patterson and the program this afternoon because, of course, I'm fairly new to the Miami area. So for me, it is a incredible learning experience. Um, I, I uh, have not read anything uh, similar to your presentation and I've enjoyed it very much. Thank you so much, Eleanor. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm so happy this was a, it was this, 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 this uh, presentation uh, offered insight on, on, um, on Miami for you. Thank you. And thank you for attending. I really appreciate it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so, ah, uh, there's Dr. Anderson, all the way from North Carolina. Oh. Yes. I've been here. <laughs> yes. I find it fascinating to learn so much about the history of Florida and African Americans. It's not something we talk about often sort of the normal uh, development of people in a state that seem to always have, well, every state does, but that has so much uh, history of killing uh, African Americans. So this it was nice to hear a, a positive note. I think what was so interesting the pushback that mm -hmm. we are not, you know, going to accept being treated just any way that, you know, you treat people and that they complained to, to Britain about it. That, that's almost comical at this point, you know, because what can you say? Mm -hmm. you know, it's, uh, I wanted to say that at the Fountain Blue on Miami, I went to a black music conference and it was in the 80s. Uh, it could have been the late 70s, early 80s. Um, but a woman named Sharon Sofa was a filmmaker and she had stealthily taken this film of the apartheid the policemen shooting children in a park. I mean, we watched this in the Fountain Blue. I'll never forget this. And then I've never seen her again. And that was my introduction to what was going on in South Africa. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought that and it was in Miami. It was in Miami Beach, you know. So the history, a lot of different histories are uh, in a boiling pot mm -hmm. in Miami because it's a major port to the mm -hmm. rest of the world, you know? Mm -hmm. But uh, this was beautiful. I really appreciate it. And my phone is ringing and I'm just gonna say text me because Valerie, uh, this is a rich, addition to very much yes you know very rich and december the 7th is my birthday and i've been called the jazz warrior i'm the jazz warrior and i put you back on that title but i suppose i am women i thought that your presentation about mariah brown you know who was a innovative woman you know, a woman, but 
I was also under the impression from something that I read or something that someone told me that many of the African Bahamians were escapees from Georgia and the Carolinas. <laughs> That's you know, and that's something that um, um, I I discovered when I um, when I was working on the the Asala. Um, I think it was the migration. I think it was my my mag migration paper, and I started looking at all of this these um, this history and um, and found out that. Um, like even during the, the American Revolution, that some of the Africans left um, the United States mm -hmm. and, and went to the Bahamas. By boat. Right. By boat. <laughs> right. And and um, with the with the Tories, right, and settled in in some of the um and and some of the uh, out islands. So. I'm, you know, I every day I, I'm I'm learning more and more about the diaspora, right? As 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 we know it, and where these cross currents and the, uh, you know, there's there's so many different ways uh, uh, where where there are cross currents, like you know, for it. So for the people who are linguists and and the Gullah, so the Gullahs and then the Bahamians. And and uh, you know that some of some of the the language um, similarities uh, and 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 meanings for phrases you know where you in you know in the Bahamas where you in a gurn you know that where are you going right and and just hearing some of the the Gullah language and skills because mm -hmm. basket weaving oh yeah basket, basket weaving, weaving. yeah. You know, Hair braiding, hair braiding, and uh, the braid, Johnny Cake, the bread, girl. Okay. I, I ate Johnny Cake when I was 12 years old. I still remember the texture and oh, yeah, I don't want it when it comes out of that stone oven. I remember yeah. that. The alcohol, of, you know, I'm ancient, so you know. But anyway, I'm saying it's so good to see you and I'll be in North Carolina in the spring. So I will hopefully we'll see each other. Valerie, I uh, hope we get to meet. And Eleanor, as usual, I look forward <laughs> to seeing you one day again. We will see each other again. Everyone have a very happy holiday. Everybody smile. Happy holiday, one and all. Oh, yes. 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 Everybody, please, please. And thank <laughs> you right. again for coming to my talk. No, no problem. <laughs> thank you. So You're it'll welcome. be live on YouTube sometime in the next three days because my brain is wet. Okay. All, all right. right. Poor brain. <laughs> so, ladies, Bye. this has been wonderful. This is a solid. South Florida, and we are know. a nonprofit uh -huh. that keeps the history of African American life alive. Alive, in South yeah. yeah. All right, ladies, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, bye, everybody. Bye. Okay.